Good morning. The African American Museum Library Coalition is preserving your life story for history. Let's start at the beginning. What is your full name? Josephine Mamie Dukes. What was your maiden name? My maiden name was Bynum. And what is your birth date? March the 10th, 1902. And now, where were you born? I didn't hear you. Where were you born? Holly Springs, Mississippi is where I was born. Your mother's name? Roxy Virginia Fant. Tell us a little bit about her. She, my mother was the second daughter in uh, a family of 11 children. She was a very loving person and she was always busy at doing something. She was, she was not lazy. And uh, as I can recall now, she loved children and she was a teacher. And when I was born, I was not supposed to live because I was too small. The doctor gave me out and told her that I would not make it because of my size. So she gave up her teaching and stayed home to take care of me. So I'm here today for that reason. All right, now what about your father? What was his name? My father's name was John Henry Bynum. He was from Alabama, close to the city of Birmingham. Tell us a little bit about his history. What did he, what was his occupation? My father was a preacher, and he was a preacher of the Methodist Episcopal Church, as it was called at that time. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had two brothers and one sister. Tell us a little bit about them. My sister was next to me. There was three years difference in our birth. And she was much larger than I was. And as we grew older, she became more like my mother than she did a sister and the younger one. And she was determined, too, to see to it that I lived. And she didn't ever mind trying to take care of me when my mother had to be out of the house or something. And she would stay right there to look over me to see that nothing happened to me. And as we grew older in school, she always took care of me when we did go to school together. How long did you live in your place of birth? Uh, 
Let's see now how to answer that. Were you there from childhood through adulthood or? When, when I was two years old, mm -hmm. my father and my mother started traveling. And from then on, every two or three years, we moved from one place to another. And the longest we ever stayed was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We stayed four years. What about some of the neighborhoods where you grew up as a child? Uh, what kind of activities did children do then? Well, we had games to play. And uh, we, we did a few folk dances. And of course, we went out in the woods quite a bit. We would go on, uh, especially when school was out, uh, at my church, we had a playground. I was the uh, supervisor or manager of the playground. And we would plan trips out in the woods to gather uh, nuts and things during the season and to locate different kinds of trees and the various animals that we could locate that we were not so afraid of and bring back leaves of the various trees and wildflowers and berries. Mm -hmm. Pardon. What influence do, do you think the church, the school, or the community had in your life's development? My home and my church and my school, all three of them. In what way? Well, at home, to learn what and how love controls your life. My mother loved me, my fa whole family loved me, and I loved them back. So we, we were a loving family. Love was there morning, noon, and night. And I always wanted to know. And when I asked questions, everybody whom I asked a question gave me an answer. And they were, People in the community were very uh, concerned about how I was treated. Going When I did start the school, going to and fro, they all looked after me to know that I was looked, uh, taken care of and no danger befell me if they could help it in all times. And they were always very kind and whatever they saw me doing that they thought would not be conducive to my livelihood or my living, I should say. They were right there to see to it that I didn't do that any further. They took excellent care of me all through the times that I was growing up, uh, going to school when I did start. At school every day, all the older students looked after me to see that nothing happened to me that would be a danger or a hindrance to me in any way. After you finished high school and went to college, describe any activities or experiences you feel that had a lasting impact on your life. First thing, I I did sing a little, and I was always in the college choir whenever we had uh, musicals in which the voice was to be used, I was always chosen. And reading poetry, I was one of the main ones when we would have programs at different times, sometimes we'd have socials and somebody was to read a poem or tell a story, and I was always chosen. And when I did graduate, I was a soloist for the class after competition. Mm, wonderful. What was the name of the college you attended? Rust College. And what was your major? English, grammar, and education. And where was Russ located? 
in the northern part of Mississippi, Holly Springs, Mississippi, on ground in which one of the battles of the Civil War was fought. Are there people during your early years that you admired? Uh, did you ever get to meet them or hear them speak? Would you ask that again, please? It said, during your early years, were there people that you admired that you, at some time or another, got to see them or hear them speak or talk to them directly? Well, there were, were people, I, in fact, I was admirer of everybody when they were an adult. Mm -hmm. My pastor, my pastor's wife, uh, the, the, at my, this is at my home church, and even our janitor, he was so, always so nice, and the, uh, all of the elderly people in our church, I admired them, everyone, and in turn, they did me, admired me to a very great extent, because I was about the smallest one in the whole church. Uh, I, I don't know if uh, I've answered you or not. Well, that's a very good answer. Thank you. Who or what influenced you to choose teaching as a career? Well, I've always said for myself, that's what I was born to do. Before I was born, I was a teacher. And when I became old enough to talk a little, and I was always asked, what you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a teacher. That was the first thing. And then I wanted to be able to play. At that time, we didn't have piano so much. I wanted to play the organ. And the next thing, I wanted to make hats. And you did all of those? Things? I've done all of those. Did you meet your husband in college or during your teaching career? During the teaching career, I met my husband. What was his occupation at the time? Well, at first, he grew up on the farm. But when he was, the year that he was to graduate, he was drafted and inducted into the army of the First World War. But when the war was over and he returned home, he went back to school and finished his education. Where was he stationed during the First World War? France, Germany, and I think Russia. Did the two of you have children? No. Mm -hmm. Describe your teaching career and share with us any significant milestones or information you would like to, for us to know about your teaching career. Well, of course, I loved my job. And I loved all the children that came to me. And I never had too much of a problem in my discipline, my children. Because, and I based it on, I loved those children as if they were mine, and they in turn loved me. So many times when they would come and we would be discussing some words or a paragraph or something, and I would have the opportunity to mention something that I especially liked. When they went home that afternoon from school, they would go and see if they could find that. And the mothers would ask them, what are you looking for? I'm looking for something for my teacher. She says she likes such and such a thing, and I want her to have it. And they would, the mother would cooperate with them and let them have it and bring it to me the next day. And of course, that touched my heart and I love them, look seemingly, that much more. 
that they thought enough of me to want to do that for me. And in so many instances, it, it hadn't been very long since I had been there as their teacher. I think I was uh, a little rough with them sometimes, but I like to use the word, I was not a mean teacher. I was gentle and kind to them and very loving. And they paid me back in kind. Uh, when they were late, I never scolded them, but I said, now let me know why you were late this morning. Because sometimes they would have a written excuse from the parents and sometimes they didn't. And when they finished explaining their reason why they were late, said, oh, all right now, I'm letting you in this morning without any penalty whatsoever, but try not to be late next time. And they weren't. Well, in order to have the kind of good discipline you had, you must have let the children know also what your standards and expectations were. Right. What were they? Well, the first one, since you have registered, I want you in school every day. I don't want any absentee marks behind your name on the register. The next thing, I, have, I don't want you to do something once I explain to you what I want done and why I want it done. No excuse. And when you are accused of something that is not in keeping with what I'm requiring, tell me the truth. And when they did something especially outstanding, I praised them. When they had a talent for anything, I saw to it that they had the opportunity to put that talent into use. Some of them could tell a story and the audience to whom they were telling the story paid attention. It put them in the mood as if they were right back there in it because they had that manner of expression that they were able to transport you from where you are to where the story uh, is located that I'm telling you. And they took pride in being able to do that where they had satisfied me. That's one of the things I, uh, that I liked in my teaching. If I didn't approve it, nobody else need come to say anything. I had to be pleased. And as long as that happened, they were happy. And another thing I said I wanted them to know, learning is not a fun thing. And you need not come to expect to have fun all day. But you, if you do what I ask you to do and leave off the things that I ask you not to do, you will have a happy school year. And they took me at my word. And we were happy. Very seldom I had to punish anybody. And, and even then, it was a mild punishment. As you, your teaching career progressed, uh, we understand that you and your husband were instrumental in starting a school. Right. How did the two of you go about it? Well, he's the one that went about it, and I came on the scene later. Uh, as, my, as my understanding is now, he had, had worked at the post office in Chicago for a good while, but the word came to him that the children were suffering for education in the place where he was born and grew up. And he decided that he would like to go back and do something about it. And he went back and uh, spent a few months taking a survey of the communities and the surrounding territory, and he found enough 
uh, evidence that what he had been hearing was true. And so when he returned to Chicago, he decided that he wanted to go back, establish a school, and teach in his community where he had grown up. Hmm. Now, tell us again about the time that uh, you and your husband caused a little bit of integration to happen within the schools? That's after we had uh, begun teaching together. Uh, this was in a, a community where there was those large plantations in the Delta section of Mississippi. And uh, we had, had interested the uh, landlord to add some more classrooms to the, uh, the school. And we added uh, an athletic department. And, it's, and they were especially centered on basketball, especially for the boys. And so many times, as the school was located close to the uh, highway, people stopped by to see that because they hadn't had that before. And they would stop by and look at it, and they began to enjoy it so much, they would stop and look at them for a while. Sometimes they'd stay for uh, half an hour, a whole hour, and sometimes just as long as the coach was teaching them and practicing. And so one day, a white principal in the Dix County happened to come by. And he saw it, and he was impressed, and he stopped and waited till the, the uh, practice session was over and talked with him and asked him, uh, why can't we get together? I have a good basketball team, and you certainly have a good one. I'm very impressed with the coach. And so he, my husband hesitated a while, and he said, well, I'm not so sure that that would work with the attitude that the different races have toward each other, I'm afraid it would cause a little too much friction. And he said, oh no, oh no, you won't have any problems whatsoever. All I ask to do is give us a chance, let us come over and talk it out and plan it and everything, there will be no trouble. And so he came and talked it over with me. I said, well, I think we can give it a try. And so we did, and it worked. They came over to play hours, and the, the, the uh, principal said, if something happens to happen accidentally, and they happen to run into one of the players, the white players, don't bother about it. I'll be there to take care of it, and there will not be any trouble. And so that's how we got started. We would go over to their school, couldn't tell the difference in the color of anybody's skin or the texture of anybody's hair. Those white teachers served us after the game was over, whoever won. They would prepare a well-balanced lunch that they knew everybody would enjoy and like, and the conversations that we uh, engaged in was concerning how each one played and the end of the, the uh, game when it was uh, terminated and comment on certain players that uh, did an outstanding job in the winning of the game. And from then on, we stayed there for seven years, no problems whatsoever. In the evening, uh, after the game was over and we had uh, been served with the food, then those who had the talent from our school and those from theirs would present a program. And for seven years, that was kept up, and no problems whatsoever from the children and the teachers and the principal, and neither the superintendent. No problems. We know you pro had many students who were successful, but tell us about Warren Rogers, who was the ambassador of goodwill. Yes. Being an ambassador of goodwill. Goodwill. And uh, sponsored by the Church of the Nazarene. 
he had the, I discovered the voice that he had. And uh, he would just go around singing with no thought about what he was doing or the talent that he had. And so I took him in hand and worked with him. And every occasion that I could find, I would give him an opportunity to sing. Uh, various music, sometimes it would be a religious hymn, sometimes it would be a popular number, and sometimes it would just be a folk song. And he sang it, and he sang it well. And from then on, he was in demand. We would take him to our uh, county meetings, and we'd take him to the district meetings, and we finally would end up on the uh, annual meeting of the uh, uh, education department for the uh, district in which we live. And then, of course, he went on further to more training until he did come in contact with the Church of the Nazarene, and he studied further and they, they sponsored him from then on. And uh, he's traveled just about all over the world. Well received. And you have another famous student, Tommy Lindsay. Tell oh, me yes. About him. Well, now, I met him after I came to California. Uh, his mother and father and his grandmother, too, lived in a, an apartment we had, and he was three years old when I met him. And I, he and I became friends right off. Any time, sometimes, when his mother didn't know where he was, she knew right away he was at my house. He was a little slow in learning to begin with, and his mother became concerned, so she told me about it one day. I said, well, just send him down to my house and I'll see what I can do. And uh, when he came one evening, he came straight to my house, and uh, I think I gave him a glass of lemonade, and we talked a little while. I said, how was school today? He said, well, pretty good. And uh, I asked him a few questions. And I saw that he was interested in wanting to know, and he could ask questions. And so I found that he was just a little slow. That was all. And I said, well, I'll check again and see why is it that he's a little slow. And it, I found out that was, his hearing was all right, his eye expansion was all right, and his ability to express himself was all right. But getting himself together to where he would respond and do. So I began working on that. And from then on, every evening, he would come to my house. And we would go over the lessons that had been assigned him by his teacher. And I asked him questions. Uh, give us a special example. Uh, during uh, Halloween, the school would have the children to celebrate it, and they would have their costumes and the uh, character that they wanted to display, and they uh, would march around through the two or three squares or uh, blocks. So he said he wanted to be in the parade. I asked him. He said, yes, I'd like to be in. And I asked him, well, what part would you like to play? I want to be the devil. And so I said, all right, we'll get your costume ready, fix it all up. And they said, but now I'm not going to do it all. You're going to have to do some of it. And he said, that'll be all right. I won't mind. And so we did. I bought the pattern, helped him, had him to help lay it on the material and pin it and everything, and he would cut some, and I'd cut, and I would explain the different markings on the pattern. And he was so enthusiastic about it, he carried me back to my childhood days. And so, from then on, every day when he would come home from school, straight to my house. 
And from, from that time on, he began to uh, be a little bit faster in catching on and understanding and being able to express himself well. And now that was uh, during the time when he was going to public school uh, from his five years, because I'd been teaching him from, from the time he was three. And I would, the uh, Salvation Army used to give a, a concert on 14th and Broadway. And I gathered the whole community of children that wanted to go to, to listen to that program and uh, take them to other places. And so our relationship started like that. And from then on, I had my hand on him from, the, from that time until he entered college in San Francisco. And we would, I still helped him with his work. It was something he didn't understand. He called me on the telephone and I would tell him whatever I could help him in, I'd get that over to him right away and he got it too. And when he finally graduated, the uh, priest, who I think was the dean at that time, wanted to meet his grandmother and me. And we did. And he said, I want to tell you, he is not one of the best that has ever been through our school. He is the best. I don't know when I quit crying for joy that here's somebody that I have been able to help. And from then on, he's been going forward. And what did he end up doing? What profession did he go into? He, he chose to teach. And he teaches very much in the same manner that I do. What, what, is, what subject does he teach? I'm not sure about the subject, then, but the, I think this is an extracurricular activity called forensics. Mm -hmm. He takes care of that. Mm -hmm. But I think he taught English, too. Mm -hmm. English, yes, he taught English grammar. And that's the one I specialized in. Now, going back to your early days, George Washington Carver spoke at your school. Yes. What was that like for you when you heard him speak and saw him? Well, one thing, it was very impressive because my maternal grandmother owned a big farm. Mm -hmm. And she raised peanuts. And of course, when he got to talking about his experience, when he was invited to the Congress to speak to them, it held me spellbound. And I took a greater interest, especially in the production of peanuts, when I found out that they did not uh, grow on the part of the plant that is above the ground. It bloomed above the ground, but the peanut was at the end of a root in the ground. And that held me spellbound when he told us all of the different things that he was going through in developing uh, the products that he did for the, in the production of the peanut. It, it, I, I was spellbound. And one of the things that impressed me a great deal, when he went in, he was limited to the amount of time he was going to be allotted. But before it was over, they extended the time. <laughs> and when he came in, when he made his entrance, uh, he had uh, something like a valet with him. And he had his suitcase, one of that old-fashioned cane kind. and. Uh, the ones that was supposed to be accepting him and guiding him to the place where he was supposed to go and everything, they went to the one that was helping him. And he related that story, of course. It provoked a little bit of laughter, and, uh, but it meant something to me. Uh, to me, that meant if you know and know you know, you don't have to fear for anything. He didn't rise up or say anything. Oh, I'm the one supposed to be 
honored. He didn't have to do that because he knew, he knew he knew, and he was prepared for whatever was required of him. And that impressed me until this day. Did you ever meet uh, Booker T. Washington? Yes, I did. What was he like? Well, uh, he was uh, quite a, an impressive personality, uh, but just down to earth. And he was very friendly, and he would impress you that he meant business and what he wanted to do in establishing more educational facilities, especially for black girls and boys. That's the main thing that impressed me about him. He knew where he was going and he knew how to get there. Wonderful. Well, we're going to move on up in time now. And I want to know, uh, did you have any other jobs before you came to California? None but teaching. Mm -hmm. And what year did you and your husband move to California? 1944, April the 27th. And what attracted you to Oakland? California is a big place. Yes, it is. And uh, I had an idea about the size in my own studies uh, of geography. And uh, the thing that drew us to California, he had some relatives out here. He had a nephew that was uh, worked on the Southern Pacific Railroad for the Pacific Railroad Company. And he had, had uh, run back and forth from Chicago to, Cal to uh, Oakland. And so when we told him that we were getting ready to move, he, he his, and his two sisters, I think it was two sisters he had, and they all got to writing and telling us this was a nice place and they thought we would like it out here and uh, you wouldn't have any problems. And so we thought it over and we continued to write back and forth until finally we decided that we would come to Oakland instead of where we had already planned. Now we had a white friend who was the, the rural post carrier and he wanted us to go to New Jersey because he was getting ready to go there himself. And he asked my husband if he would write him a recommendation and he wrote that and he left and, wrote, and shortly after he got to New Jersey where he was going to settle, he wrote us back, it's a nice place, you will like it here and there will be no segregation. Mm -hmm. And so between the two we were halted there for a while. But when his nephew and his nieces continued to write back and forth, we decided, well, since we have relatives there, maybe that is the better place for us to go because we don't have anybody in New Jersey. And that's why we are in Oakland, California today. In 1944, what was the social and ethnic neighbor, uh, makeup of the neighborhood that you lived in? Let's see, one, we had the black, the Mexicans, white, and Chinese. Hmm. Did they relate to each other? Wouldn't have wanted it any better. Hmm. There was a grocery store on the corner, the Chinese owned that. And they were just as receptive of us as if we had been there all our lives together. Very, very accommodating. And if there was anything at all that they could do, they were willing and offered it. And in turn, if I may say that, in turn, we helped them a lot. They were in China, they were under the communist rule. And they had to, uh, go through some problems in order to get from China over here. And they had to leave some of their children. And they had to send money back and forth trying to get them to let their children come to California. But some of them 
had made it at that time. And so they became acquainted with us and they asked me and my husband to teach them how to become a naturalized citizen. And we got together and decided, now should we do that? And how are we gonna do it? So we, kind of, we did get together and every evening when they had closed the store, we, one or the other of us, or both of us, would go into the store and teach them about an hour, or sometimes an hour and a half. Because others had taught them and they had tried to pass the examination, but they couldn't pass it. So finally, when we finished with them, they came home one evening and rang the doorbell and I answered the door, Congratulate me, I passed my examination, I'm now an American citizen, and I'm happy. And they've been friends even until yet, they're friends to me. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. What is your philosophy in life? What do you think got you this far? <laughs> That's a little tough one. Well, first thing, mine is strictly, for the most part, religious. It's, I'm rooted and grounded in uh, Christianity. And I am a firm believer that love conquers everything. And if you have faith, you must have faith in yourself and in your fellow man. But it must all be tied in there with your love of all of God's creation. That's wonderful. I noticed that you have a couple of photographs next to you. Would you tell us about, about those? This one is one taken shortly after I had finished school and had accepted a teaching job. I didn't have to apply for it. One of our friends or neighbors had noticed that I had been helping my mother, who was a teacher, to teach the children in our home. And we would help my mother. After we learned the alphabet, then we would help her to teach it to those children who were not going to anybody's school. And so, uh, after I did finish my education and was ready to go to work, this same neighbor was the principal of a school in a short distance from Memphis, Tennessee. And there's where he asked me to come and accept a position on the faculty at his school. Wonderful. And what about the picture next to it? Now, that one is from my church, Taylor Memorial United Methodist Church, located at 1188 on 12th Street in Oakland. And on my 100th birthday, they had all planned it and all of those things together and I didn't even know about it until I received the invitation. Well, Mrs. Dukes, we could go on forever. This has been so interesting, but we must come to an end. And I'd like to say the African American Museum Library Coalition is proud to honor you as one of its historians in the Eternal Voice program on this day of January the 11th, 2003. And thank you. And may I respond, this has certainly been a signal honor for me. I never thought when I came to California that I would be the recipient of such not only kindness, but loving kindness. Uh, pardon me if I sometimes use that word love, but it is one 
of the main things that I've always had myself, and I, with the training that I had when I was growing up and the care that I had, I believe in love. As I said so many times, it's just a four-letter word spelled L-O-V-E, love. And that, to me, conquers everything. Thank you, Mrs. Dukes. And I thank you so much for your love and kindness and the honor which you have bestowed upon me today. I accept it with love and gratitude and a sincere wish for your continued activity in along that line. It means something.